Hallelujah. The message this evening is called Maintaining the Anointing of the Holy Ghost. First of all, the anointed Word of God will bring the results and solve problems in your life which may have been tormenting you for a long time. Much too long for Christians to have been carrying around. And I see this. The Word of God defeats the enemy in any test, temptation, circumstance, or attack that may come from the enemy. And who is the enemy? It's the devil. How many of you know there's a devil? A lot of people don't believe there's a devil. Did you know that? Yeah. My dear people, there's a devil. If you don't think there's a devil, let me ask you something. Why are you a Christian? Why would you worry about it? You better believe it. There's a devil. That's why we're saved. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> you turn with me, please. And Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. This is where Jesus Christ, being full of the Holy Ghost, was just returning from the river Jordan. He had just been uh, baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. If you look over here at verse 16, it says, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mitre than I cometh, the latchet of whose I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And with fire. And then you see the very next uh, step here, uh, in verse 22, you'll see, And the Holy Ghost descended in a, be- in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And then we go to chapter 4. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, in other words, he had been filled with the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan. He had just returned from the river Jordan. And he was led by the Spirit. If you notice there, he's being led by the Spirit. My dear people, if you want to be led by the Spirit, you've got to be full of the Holy Ghost. That's simple. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. In other words, he was fasting and praying. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said to him, there was he spoke to him, If thou be the Son of God, <clears throat> command this stone that it be made bread. My dear people, what was the temptation? What was the temptation? The devil's saying to him, if you be the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. So the temptation was to tempt him to act as the Son of God, to act in his deity. But if you notice what Jesus said, he said, answered him and saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In other words, why is he saying that? Because Jesus was here as the Son of Man. The devil is trying to get him to... Act as the Son of God. But he said, No, I am the Son of Man, <clears throat> full of the Holy Ghost and fire. That's what he's saying. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word of God. Now, what does that mean? Well, we'll keep going. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. <clears throat> My dear people, the devil there is talking about his spiritual kingdoms. And that they did not belong to him, it would have not have been a temptation, would it not? See? Those spiritual kingdoms belong to the devil. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> In verse 7 it says, If thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. And then the devil said, For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee. Even the devil knows the power of the Word of God. He tried to use it himself. He tried to pick up the sword and hit Jesus with it. The sword of the Spirit. And you look at verse 12, And Jesus Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, in other words, it is spoken, that 
Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed him <coughs> from him for a season. For a season. The devil never goes anywhere permanently. Just for a season. Just like he did with Jesus. And he comes after us. He comes after us. <coughs> you defeat him with the Word of God, but that doesn't mean he's gone forever. He's going to come back after another season. You better believe it. You better believe it. Start stepping out for God. You better believe it. <clears throat> if you notice <clears throat> what Jesus was doing, He was combating the devil, how? With the Word of God. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. Why was He doing that? Because that is the sword of the Spirit. It talks about in Ephesians 6.17. That is the sword of the Spirit. Jesus combated him with the Word of God. And it should be a lesson for each and every one of us as we are to use God's Word to combat the devil. Satan cannot oppose God's Word. Why? He must bow to the Word of God. He must bow to the blood of the Lamb. He must bow to the resurrected Son. <clears throat> Jesus walked away from the devil's temptation, defeating Satan with God's Word. Word. Did you notice he didn't say, hey, leave me alone, I am the Son of God. He said, Son of man, didn't he? Man shall not live by bread alone. <clears throat> he didn't call down a hundred thousand angels. He said, it is written. Why? Because he was in that wilderness as a man anointed with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And what did he do? He spoke the Word of God. He spoke the Word of God. He spoke the sword of the Spirit. The same thing we're supposed to do. Is not Jesus Christ our example? He is our example, is He not? Okay. <clears throat> if you notice here, uh, <clears throat> in verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out fame of him uh, through all the region round about. In other words, he returned in the power of the Holy Ghost to Galilee. My dear people, <clears throat> I'm going to be teaching tonight on the anointing and how to maintain the anointing. <clears throat> because you see, the power of the Holy Ghost. You listen to me. The power of the Holy Ghost is where the anointing is at. That is where the anointing is at. And you know what? Every one of you that's got the Holy Ghost in them has got that anointing. You're not maintaining it. You're not maintaining it. And I'm going to teach you tonight how to maintain that anointing. <clears throat> if you are abiding in the Holy Spirit, you will move in the Spirit and you will minister to the needs of the people with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Jesus is our example in all things. We're all agreed to that. And he lived and he walked in the Spirit, did he not? He practiced abiding in the Spirit. The result of a lifestyle dominated by the Spirit of God. If you remember last week, I think I, I, I went through eight examples through the Word of God, where Jesus just walked about doing good, and what was he doing? He was healing the sick, he was casting out devils. <clears throat> Did he have one prayer meeting? Did he pray for them? Did he? Did he get the phone and say, oh, come and pray for Aunt Mary? No. What did he do? He, he spoke the word on them and laid his hands on them. Why, was he, why did he do that? Because he was walking in the anointing. He was walking in the anointing. Don't get me wrong, my dear people. Prayer is good. Prayer is good. But you have to know when and where and how and what. In Acts 10.38, thank you, Jesus. The Word of God says <clears throat> how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all, all that were oppressed of the devil 
for God was with him. And then in Luke 4, 18, the Word of God says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's talking to us, he's talking to the disciples, uh, because he hath anointed me. It is important to notice also, and you can study this out in Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, that Jesus could do no mighty works because of doubt and unbelief when he went back to his own village of Nazareth. We've all read that, have we not? He could do no mighty works because of doubt and unbelief. In John 1, 1, the Word of God says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Say that again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we see in verse 14, the Word says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So what is the Word saying there? That Jesus was made flesh, the Word. He was the Word and dwelt among us, did He not? Okay. So the Word of God is what? It is the agent. Was not Jesus the agent? Jesus was the agent that walked the earth, right? Was not Jesus the Word? That's right. So Jesus was the agent, or, or the Word is the agent, by which he accomplishes his will upon the earth. The Word of God. Jesus Christ was the perfect will of God manifested in the flesh, was he not? Okay. Almost every recorded miracle performed by Jesus, he used the Word of God to command every hindrance or problem to come into subjection to His Word, which is the Word of God. You see, my dear people, God has already sent to you, He has sent salvation, He has sent His Word to heal you, He has sent to overturn any situation in your life. And the Lord is saying this evening, He's saying, put His work, or I mean, put His Word to work in you. Put his word to work. Speak his word and put it to work. If you remember, as I just wrapped it up last week, I had said many times in the word of God, if you'll notice, we read that Jesus was frequently slip away to spend prayer time with the Father. Is that not right? That's right. Do you know what he was doing? He was maintaining his anointing. That's what he was doing. He was maintaining his anointing. Jesus was constantly abiding in prayer. With the Father, he was abiding in his presence in order to maintain his anointing. You'll find in Matthew 14, 23, the Word of God says, He went up into a mountain to pray. You'll find in Matthew 26, 36, where He was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. You'll find in Luke 6, 12, <clears throat> where He prayed in the mountain all night. You say, how do you pray all night? Or how do you pray for several hours? It's very simple, my dear people. You pray in the Holy Ghost. You pray in your spiritual heavenly language. <clears throat> you can go and go and go and go and never stop. That's right. That's right. That, what do you think it's for? That's what it's for. That's how you maintain your anointing. You pray in the Holy Ghost because that's where the anointing abides. That's where the anointing behind, abides. Why do you think the devil comes at everyone? Every, every church that you can ever think of, well, you better not uh, get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's from the devil. That's from the devil. The first thing the devil wants to do is disarm you. He wants to disarm you. That way you've got no power. You understand? It's the first thing he wants to do. Jesus Christ was maintaining his anointing. We see in John chapter 14, verse 12... Pay attention now, people. John 14, 12, the Word of God says, Verily, verily, 
I say unto you. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to us, is he not? <clears throat> he that believeth. How many believers have we got in here? How many believers? If we got no believers tonight, you're going to believe before you get out of here, I guarantee you. <laughs> but he's saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, on Jesus Christ, the works that I do, you listen to me, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. <clears throat> You see, Jesus Christ gave that same power and authority to his disciples and to his body of Christ. Who is the body of Christ? That's right. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his mouth. We are his pocketbook. <clears throat> you understand? Okay. Before the disciples or the body of Christ could speak God's word with power and authority, they had to receive the same Holy Ghost that Jesus received. You agree with that? We have got the same Holy Ghost in us. That's where the anointing's at. You understand? Okay. We find in Luke twenty four, forty nine. The Word of God says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. <clears throat> Talking about the believers here. And he says, But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. With power from on high. In other words, he's saying to the disciples, Hey, don't you even walk out the door without the Holy Ghost. Don't you even walk out the door. Why? Because you've got no power. Why? Because we are in a spiritual war. We are in a spiritual war. In Ephesians 6.12, the Word of God says, We wrestle not with flesh and blood, what is, <clears throat> but with spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities and powers and rulers of the air. What are they talking about? Spiritual beings. Are they not? Is that what the Word of God is saying? Spiritual beings. You better believe it. How many of you know that God's a spirit? How many of you know that God's a spirit? You believe that? The Word of God says He's a spirit. We believe He's a spirit. Right? Who created us? Did God create us? Which is more real? Which is more real? The things of the Spirit. God created us is more real. Our Creator is more real than us walking around here if He created us, and He did. <clears throat> See? So what's more real? Spiritual things are more real than things in the natural, things that you can see. You have to learn how to walk in it. You have to learn how to abide and walk in it. Amen. Jesus promised his disciples that the same Holy Spirit with that anointing power would come up on them and abide with them. The disciples became anointed with power from on high as they obeyed the instructions of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the book of Acts real quick. Chapter 1. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, this is where Jesus had commanded the disciples who were in the upper room to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And then verse 8 we see, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and then you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. In 
And then we see the fulfillment of that promise in Acts chapter 2. The Word of God says, beginning in verse 1, then what, then, And then the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place, just like we are here. Matter of fact, they were in the upper room. They were in the upper room, and they were in one accord. <coughs> and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, like as of fire. And it set up on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. How many of you know there were 120 people in that upper room, including the mother of Jesus, Mary? Because I've heard people say, well, them tongues, them's from the devils. Have you heard that? Do you mean that Jesus would let all those people get filled with the Holy Ghost, including the 12 apostles? Actually, there was 11 at that time. 11 apostles and Mary? Ain't no way. Ain't no way. You see, <clears throat> with the anointing of that Holy Ghost and fire, they became, they were transformed into holy men of power. People will say to me, you know, I've got this call in my heart, but I can't just seem to open my mouth and do it. That's because they're going to have the power in them. Or they're not maintaining it. Because you see, Peter walked right out the door here and 3,000 people were saved as soon as he opened his mouth. Why? Because he was full of the Holy Ghost and power. And see, he had been maintaining that prayer life, seeking it, wouldn't he? He had been maintaining, you see. There's nobody in the Bible that went out and just laid hands on people and they got, they got set free, delivered, uh, 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 cast devils out of them or anything else and did not pray. Everybody wants to do it and not pray. <clears throat> God cannot move through the flesh. He has to move through the Spirit. He has to move through the Spirit. So you have to pray in the Spirit to get the flesh out of the way so that God can move through you. And that's how you do it. That's how you do it. You have to maintain that anointing of the Holy Ghost. That's what He's there for. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But these men and women, of course, that were, that were endued with the power from up on high, they went out and they healed the sick and they brought deliverance to the captives and they changed nations and they changed those around them. They turned the town upside down. You want to turn this town upside down? Start going out here laying hands on the sick. Go to the green grocery and you see some, some lady there sick, start praying for her. Just lay hands on her. Hmm? Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> So how did they maintain the anointing of the Holy Spirit? How did they maintain the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Because this is, this is what we're after tonight. How did they maintain that anointing? If you look at Acts chapter 6, and this is where a lot Everybody misses it. Excuse me. Beginning in verse 1. And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, in other words, the, the numbers of believers, we're, we're, disciples are believers, it was multiplied, in other words, they kept growing, they kept getting more and more, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because of the widows that were neglected in the daily administration. In other words, they were moaning to the apostles because the widows and the people in the church, they weren't being taken care of. They were, in other words, they were saying to that, that pastor, uh, uh, hey, the widows, and, and, uh, and they're not being taken care of. They were moaning. See? <clears throat> or that vicar, whatever. Okay. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them, and they said, hey, it is not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve God tables. It is not reasonable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, 
full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint, uh, appoint over this business. Why? <clears throat> Verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. What were they doing? They were maintaining their anointing. They were maintaining their anointing. And that's what a man of God has got to do. You've got to maintain the anointing. <clears throat> Verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. You notice that? Stephen was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip. And then, uh, uh, what's some names here, Procreus and Nicanor and Timion and Parmaeus and Nicholas whom they set before the apostles, uh, and when they prayed, they laid their hands on them. Who did? The, 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 uh, the, the apostles or laid their hands on them. Why? Because they are part of the five-fold ministry. What does the five-fold ministry do? It teaches. It teaches. <clears throat> Who? The disciples. To do what? To go out to minister. To maintain their anointing. That's what the five-fold ministry does. <clears throat> Listen to this. Verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied. In other words, the, the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied. In other words, there's more believers, and more believers, and more believers. Why? Because the leaders were maintaining their anointing. They were maintaining their anointing. That's why the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied. It says that they multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got Stephen here. Well, he wasn't no apostle. That's right. He was a deacon. Stephen was a deacon. Stephen was a deacon. Well, here's Stephen. He's full of faith and power. He did great wonders and miracles among the people. Why is that? He was close enough to those apostles uh, he saw what was going on. He was maintaining his anointing too. You better believe it. He was maintaining his anointing. What anointing? The anointing of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Verse 9. And then there arose certain of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of the Libertarians and Syrians. Verse 10. <laughs> And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Who? Stephen. They couldn't resist the, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. What does that mean? You see, Stephen was maintaining his anointing. You can tell by the fruit. You know why? First of all, he was doing signs and wonders among the people. And secondly, he was walking in revelation knowledge of what? The Word of God. My dear people, if you don't maintain the anointing, you won't get any revelation knowledge of this Word. You won't get any. You won't. It depends how far you want to go with God. Hallelujah. Something else I wanted to point out to you. If you go back up to verse 5, it said Stephen, if you notice, he was a deacon. He was over the daily ministration of feeding the poor, who was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Then it says, and Philip, who was also a deacon. Well, Philip, you see over here in, in Acts uh, chapter 8, verse 5. Here's another deacon. Verse 5. Then Philip went down into the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing.